Hello, everybody. I'm going to give people a few moments to come into the webinar. Hello and welcome to Fermentology. I'm Karen Ciccone from the NC State University Libraries in Raleigh, North Carolina in the United States. And I'm subbing for Michelle Jewell, who's away doing field work. For those of you who are new, Fermentology is a mini seminar series on the culture, science, and history of our everyday fermented foods. We have had guests from all over the planet join us on a semi-weekly basis since April of 2020. Uh, recordings of previous talks are available on the Applied Ecology YouTube channel. You can just go to YouTube and search for Fermentology to find the channel. And I'll share that link in, a ch in the chat in just a minute. We will have a live Q&A after the talk. So if you have questions, please enter them using the Q&A feature in Zoom. Uh, I won't be able to get to everybody's questions, but I'll do the best I can. And today, our guest is Dr. Heather Paxson. She's a professor and program head of anthropology at MIT, where she teaches courses on food, family, craft, ethnographic research, and the meaning of life. She's the author of The Life of Cheese, Crafting Food and Value in America, and an area editor of the Oxford Companion to Cheese. She's gonna take us through the history of US food safety regulation of cheese and address the question of whether cheese made from raw milk is inherently riskier than cheese made from pasteurized milk. Thanks for being here and welcome Dr. Paxson. Thanks so much for inviting me. Um, I'm really pleased to be here to talk with you about cheese safety um, as an anthropologist. Uh, so just a caveat there, um, let me, share my screen. Okay. I've got a couple of keyboards here. So let me just, okay, here we go. Cheese as a fermented food is alive with bacteria, yeasts, and molds whose metabolic activity, breaking down sugars and proteins in milk generates the aromas, flavors, and textures that we recognize as cheese. It can also, if rarely, harbor pathogens responsible for foodborne illness. In the US, cheese safety is promoted through routine pasteurization of the milk used to make it. Cheese made from unpasteurized milk is a regulatory exception. To be sold in the US, Cheese must be made either from pasteurized milk or aged for a minimum of 60 days at a temperature no less than 1.37 degrees centigrade. The 60 day rule dates to World War II when an overseas outbreak of typhoid was traced to a young batch of contaminated unpasteurized cheddar. Subsequent lab study found that aging cheddar made from raw milk proved sufficient after 60 days to knock out Salmonella typhimorium. The premise of the 60-day aging rule is that as a cheese, such as cheddar, ages or matures, it dries out and becomes more acidic, sharper, we might say, and therefore is a microbial environment increasingly inhospitable to pathogenic germs such as Salmonella that could be introduced to milk through insanitary dairying. For 70 years, US safety standards have been guided by a binary distinction between cheese made from pasteurized milk and cheese made from raw or unpasteurized milk. But today, the 60-day rule put in place in 1949 at the height of the industry's industrialization is becoming obsolete, outmoded on the one hand by the emerging growing and growing awareness of new pathogens of concern particularly toxigenic E. coli and Listeria monocytogenes, which behave differently than Salmonella, and on the other, by a surge of artists and cheesemakers keen to work with raw milk and customers eager to consume it as cheese. Given growing, given growing consumer interest in fermented foods, civic support for artisan agriculture, and anti-big government sentiment, 
A total ban on raw milk cheese is politically unlikely, although likely some in the FDA would probably love nothing more. Still, the legal future of raw milk cheese has for decades been subject to on and off regulatory review and remains far from certain. As an anthropologist, I want to call attention to the role and the trouble of classification in food safety guidance and regulation. Promoting cheese safety through mandating either pasteurization or minimum aging creates a binary world of cheese made either from pasteurized or from raw milk, leading to binary all or nothing thinking about quality and safety. Such that we hear raw milk cheese is inherently dangerous, a public, a public health disaster waiting to happen, and also, or also, the most beautiful, most perfect food humans have ever known. But even the very distinction of raw versus pasteurized milk imposes a binary in what's actually a continuum. By US legal definition, any milk that's not fully pasteurized, heated at a set temperature for a set time to virtually kill off all microflora present, is classified as raw. What's labeled as raw milk cheese then may actually be made from milk that's been heat treated to a, a subject to a gentler heat treatment known as thermalization or pushed through microfiltration that affects a similar near total reduction in microbes. In any event, I contend that future regulation to ensure the safety of raw milk cheese will need to overcome such binary thinking. To demonstrate why, let me start with a bit of history. First, let us agree that raw milk cheese is a modern invention, by which I mean the idea of raw milk cheese as a food category doesn't exist without its opposite, pasteurization. Up until 100 years ago, of course, all cheese was made with raw milk or unpasteurized, and it wasn't remarkable. It was just cheese. For generations, cheese making was considered a domestic art. Farm women added rennet when milk felt warm to their touch. They drained curd from the whey when it had the right grip in their fingers, not when an, uh, not when an acidometer told them to. Quality was variable. And by the mid 19th century, cheese making's inconsistency came to be derided as unscientific and inefficient. In the span of a single generation in this country, men took over cheese production through a regional factory system, pooling fresh milk from neighboring farms and scaling up methods that women had used in home kitchens. Consistency remained a problem until bacteria were discovered to be responsible for curdling. Once scientists learned to isolate and cultivate acidifying bacteria in the lab, pasteurization soon followed. Beginning in the 1930s, American factories reformulated their recipes to work with pasteurized milk by reseeding it with commercial starter cultures of bacteria to kickstart fermentation. This innovation enabled cheesemakers to work with older milk that had traveled greater distances to the creamery. Pasteurization not only starts a cheese off with a microbially clean slate, it has the effect of slowing cheese ripening over time. Less microbial diversity means less metabolic activity, a slower creep towards rot, and a more standardized product. In practical terms then, the introduction of pasteurization had to do with consistency, standardization, and economies of scale market concerns. In symbolic terms, pasteurization represented the techno-scientific control of nature for human ends, making cheese an emblem of innovation and modern progress. By the 1950s, pasteurized milk cheese had become the unmarked category. I didn't grow up talking about pasteurized cheese, it was just cheese. Among older artisan factories that resisted automation, some installed pasteurizers while others did not. But half a century ago, use of unpasteurized milk wasn't advertised as the gustatory or probiotic virtue it often is today. My point is that as a food category to be defended or challenged, raw milk cheese is meaningful in comparison to pasteurized counterparts. What it means culturally continues to take shape as the meaning of pasteurized cheese evolves. 
middle of the 20th century, raw milk cheese looked to be obsolete. To food scientists for whom antimicrobial benefits of pasteurization are incontrovertible, and who envision industrial scale farming when they envision a milking parlor, making cheese from unpasteurized milk is an unnecessary risk. In their view, what I have called a pasteurian view, raw milk cheese is not merely a backwards holdover from a pre-pasteurian past, it's irrational. For pasteurians, pasteurization civilizes ruminant milk, making it safe, indeed appropriate, for human consumption. And so for 70 years, safety standards have treated cheese made from raw milk as inherently categorically different than pasteurized cheese milk pasteurized milk cheese. Now, fast forward a generation to the artisan renaissance. Cheese making was returned to American farms in the 1970s and 80s by hippie homesteaders for whom handcrafted cheese represented a natural food, valued for its gourmet appeal, not for its gourmet appeal, but for its symbolic opposition to the bland homogenization of industrial foods epitomized by plastic wrapped slices of processed cheese food. Against the hyperhygienic Pasteurian approach that regards nature as an unruly threat to be tamed, reducing the world of ambient microorganisms to potential pathogens. Whoops, that's that slide. Artisanal methods take a more environmentalist view of the nature of milk, welcoming a diversity of bacteria, yeasts, and molds into cheese making as, as potential collaborators. I've called this artisanal approach post pasteurian Post in that it takes after pasteurianism in acknowledging pathogenic risk and in taking hygiene seriously, but it also moves beyond an antiseptic attitude to cultivate good microbes and to enlist them as allies that might outcompete the bad ones through a process of competitive exclusion. To do so, they approach cheese making as a labor intensive practice of managing the microbial environment. That environment begins with healthy animals and good hygiene in the milking parlor, continues as proper temperature and acidity control in the vat, and then scales down to a wheel of cheese itself, managed as a microbial environment by brushing the surface with salt brine and controlling the ambient temperature and humidity in the aging room. This is not a, a pre-modern throat. There is no magical thinking here. Successful post-pasteurians reserve the right to be scrupulous in what they do. Now we can begin to see the trouble with the reductive binary approach to cheese safety, relying on either pasteurization or aging, regardless of whether a cheese is made using industrial or artisanal methods, and regardless of whether we're talking cheddar, camembert, or what have you. The trouble is that it obscures these other distinctions that also contribute to risk and safety. In reality, cheese safety and quality depend on the health of dairy animals and the hygiene of milk production, on the skill and care of cheesemakers, and on the ability of those good microbes to vanquish the bad itself a feature of moisture content and acidity linked to recipe, as well as environmental conditions like temperature and humidity. It's a problem that meaningful contingent distinctions regarding process, skill, and care are not captured by regulatory or even culinary cheese categories. Indeed, in generalizing from the microbial environment of cheddar, which loses moisture and gains acidity as it ages, the 60-day aging rule has set market standards that permit the possibility of unsafe foods entering it. Again, by US law, a cheesemaker may sell raw milk cheese, regardless of what type, only after it reaches an age of 60 days. However, contradicting the premise of the 60-day aging rule, aging a mold-ripened cheese, such as brie or camembert, turns out to increase its pathogenic vulnerability because unlike cheddar, by 60 days, its acidity actually declines. Of particular concern is Listeria monocytogenes, a bacterium that can cause listeriosis. Although rare, listeriosis has a 20% fatality rate 
and accounts for roughly one fourth of deaths attributed to foodborne illness in the US. Listeria is also partial to high moisture and low acidity. Moreover, unlike E. coli, which originates in manure and can enter the milk supply through insanitary dairying, Listeria is ubiquitous and likely to infect a cheese during manufacture, aging, or packaging. Pasteurizing milk prior to cheese making is no barrier to this sort of contaminant. contaminant. It's in the environment. Although FDA officials never intended to establish the 60-day rule as an equivalent standard to pasteurization, that's how some consumers and even a few short-lived producers, unfortunately, have come to view it. In 2017, an outbreak of listeriosis traced to legally aged, though improperly made, raw milk cheese hospitalized eight people and resulted in two deaths. A clear problem with a 60-day rule for ensuring the safety of raw milk cheese is that not all cheeses behave like hard, dry, sharp cheddar, and not all pathogens behave like salmonella. But the broader problem I'm suggesting is absolutist thinking about pasteurization and about microbes. If food scientists and regulators tend to overestimate the supremacy of pasteurization, others may overestimate the power of those good microbes to guarantee both quality and safety of fermented foods. A few years ago, I discovered print-on-demand t-shirts, bumper stickers, even baby bibs, Emblem, um, emblem, um, excuse me, emblazoned with a smiling microbe and the slogan, I'm a post-pasturian. The website explained, what is a post-pasturian? A really smart, smart person who understands that pasteurization kills all, yes, all the good in food. Now, in putting the be beneficent nature, supernaturally enlivened by microorganisms, against a power-greedy culture embodied by regulatory overreach, the view espoused here is anti, not post-pasturian, at least as I defined it in a, 20, a 2008 article. Pasteurization does not kill all the good in food any more than it guarantees safety. The trouble with food safety regulation is that it is based on classification that generalizes within type. As a microbial ecology, no less than as a food, raw milk cheese is not one thing. It is not all equally well-made or equally risky or equally tasty. And our current typologies and regulatory categories cannot account for the contingencies that matter. Thank you. <laughs> There's a lot to talk about, so let me stop this. That was a very kind of Big overview. <laughs> so I look forward to the uh, questions to sort of flesh it out a little bit. Whoops, I don't have your volume on. I, I'm, I was muted. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, <laughs> that was a great juxtaposition of the uh, American cheese versus cheese. And uh, that was really eye opening. Uh, thank you for that talk. Um, I uh, invite folks to put questions in using the Q&A feature in the webinar. Um, I um, actually have a question that I can ask while we're waiting to see if there are other questions. Um, I was struck by uh, your describing the early cheesemakers as being women and that mm -hmm. as cheesemaking as people wanted to make it more scientific and standardized, it was taken over by men. And that reminded me of a recent article that I read about women being um, brewing beer, being the original beer brewers, and how that industry was also taken over by men. And I was wondering if you were aware of any parallels there. Yeah, sure. I mean, I think, um... Absolutely, before the industrialization of food production, right? Um, much of it was domestically produced for both uh, consumption, like domestic consumption, but also for trade, right? But production, the household was the site of production, 
for household consumption and for trade, right? For, for other things. So New England, like cheese came to the US, right? With the Puritans, New England, um, early site of cheese making. And early on in the 17th century, cheese made by farm women in New England was being traded to the West Indies for, for rum. <laughs> um, so, uh, it was it ha, you know it was made to travel. <laughs> uh, the quality was uh, you know it was it was about preserving milk, right? Cheese was really uh, technology for preserving milk. It was not so much um, the kind of treats, uh, the gourmet treats, in the way that the a lot of the varieties that you know I was showing photos of today. Um, but it was uh, very much an important part of. Uh, the subsistence of a domestic farm economy, right, um, of preserving food for, for winter um, and for trade, for travel. Sure. Um, I have a question. Uh, there's a cheesemaker in Massachusetts that only heats its milk to 140 degrees, mm. which I understand gets rid of the bad bacteria but leaves the good ones, that is the ones that are good for your gut. Is that true or is that just part of their story? Yeah, so that's that's the thermalization that I that I um, uh, mentioned. So the FDA would class that as a raw milk cheese, but you're right that that sub that sub pasteurization heat treatment does kill off a lot of um, pathogens of concern, right? So um, salmonella and E. coli might very well be, that, that would be present in the milk before cheese making begins, might well be by knocked off from that. It's no guarantee though. I mean, I guess this is the point that I really wanna make, like neither pasteurization nor aging cheese in and of itself is sufficient to guarantee safety, um, which is a much more complex question of, Quality of quality of the ingredients, hygiene in the in, in all the facilities, and um, and the the quality of the the method used, right? How well the cheesemaker controlled acidity, controlled humidity, um, so that those good microbes can actually do their job in out competing any potential. Um, pathogens that can enter in at any time, right? They can enter in through, through raw milk, through insanitary dairy, from the milking parlor and the animal, or, or the an unhealthy animal, right? Tuberculosis can be passed from bovine to, to human through the milk. Um, but that's not it. And the listeria, which is one of the most prominent um, issues, you know, pathogens of concern, is not, is, pasteurization is not going to um, affect that, nor thermalization. Right, so it's it's not the end of the story. Although it, it is one tool that cheesemakers have to affect um, microbial control. Thanks. Um, what is the difference between U.S. raw cheese making and the other countries such as France? Is Camembert subject to the sixty day rule? Yeah. So, okay, super great question. Thank you for that. Um, Quick answer is no, <laughs> the 60 day rule is exclusive to the US. Um, although Canada, Canada is similar with Quebec is a French exception. <laughs> um, so one of the things that's interesting, I've been studying this you know, on and off for years now, is that in the United States, as there's more interest in raw milk cheeses and sort of more, more ways in which cheese making is not relying on pasteurization and, and heat treatment. Uh, in Europe, we're sort of seeing the opposite. So in Europe, there's this long, vibrant tradition of raw milk cheese making, and um, there, there are raw milk cheese, um, there is raw milk cheese making with these softer, bloomy rind types that are harder to affect microbial control. Um, but the EU, not France per se, maybe, but the EU is definitely imposing more stringent microbial controls that are more in line with what the FDA does. So they're kind of meeting in the middle. Um, part in Europe, uh, it's not just a matter of um, a uniform, if they don't have a one size fits all model of safety controls the way they have in the US. So 
part of the safety controls are organized through the um, name protections, the AOC in France, the DOP, DP, um, so Camembert de Normandy, to you have the name Camembert de Normandy um, has to be made in Normandy <laughs> with certain, you know, kinds of breed of cows and all this kind of stuff, but also with raw milk. Okay, that's the only raw, but most Camembert in France is with pasteurized milk now. That wouldn't have been the case 30 years ago. I don't know actually exactly which, which decade that would have switched. I think it's only 5% of Camembert in France now is made with raw milk, and that's the DOP or the AOC Camembert in Normandy. So it's very complicated in the EU because of the name controls um, meeting the codex safety controls and a whole complicated set of negotiations there. What should the consumer look for when purchasing artisanal cheese? Uh, this person says they have a colleague whose wife is an artisanal goat cheese crafter and they had to go through a permitting and inspection process. Yeah, so wait, the, what was the beginning of that question about? Uh, what should the consumer look for? Oh, consumer. So, so to be sold, I mean, legal sale of cheese is highly regulated, um, the, uh, or, or rather what I should say is what's regulated are the, um, the physical plants where cheeses are produced. So the you, uh, uh, creamery has to be licensed and has to buy milk from um, a licensed dairy or produce the milk themselves. So if you buy a cheese in the store or in a farmer's market, you can be you can be confident that um, it has been, the, the, the facilities are inspected. Wisconsin is the only state in the country that kind of regulates the skill of its cheese makers. So in Wisconsin, which of course has this very rich history of cheese making, there is a, it's a cheese making is a, a, is a profession and there's a certification process and to be a master cheesemaker, you have to go through, you know, cheesemakers actually have to be certified and take tests and things like this. Um, everywhere else, it's not the cheesemaker who's certified, it's only the facilities where the cheese is produced. Um, what you should look for is, um, well, it depends on what kind of cheese you're talking about. <laughs> um, so you can, you know, if you're shopping at a farmer's market, you can talk to the farmers, the farmer, right? The producer or the, or the person responsible for, you know, um, uh, representing them and ask questions and maybe learn how long they've been doing it. You can certainly ask whether they pasteurize or not, if, if that's, um, you know, of, of concern to you or of interest. But I think you know, the longer somebody's been producing, that might give you, you know, some certainty. I, I think if you're if you're in the before times, before the pandemic times, I would say the best way to buy cheese is to taste it before you buy it. You know, the cheeses that I'm many of the cheeses I'm talking about, not all of them, they're they're pretty pricey, right? And that's because of the labor um, and the small economies of scale. Um, but most, like even Whole Foods increasingly, right? There are opportunities to sample the cheese before you buy it. Um, so that's always a good way to do it too. <laughs> there are a lot of questions in the queue right now, but I really only have time for one more question. Um, you mentioned that the pH of feta increases with age. Does storing the feta in brine eliminate the risk of listeria or other pathogenic microbial contamination? So brine is salt, right? And salt is an antimicrobial agent too. Um, if it's well kept, right, at, the, at a cool temperature in the brine, it can, it can last pretty well. I think that is pretty safe. But I'm not a, but I'm not a microbiologist. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, it's a disclaimer. <laughs> well, I think we've come to the end of our time. Thank you so much. Uh, sorry I couldn't get to all the questions. And uh, you can contact Dr. Paxson uh, through email if you have more questions. And the book is The Life of Cheese. <laughs> yes. Um, and I can put that in the chat again.
And uh, just a reminder, there'll be a recording of this talk uh, on the Applied Ecology YouTube channel uh, within a few days. So um, thank you again. And oh, next time, uh, May 20th, um, we will have the world's only sourdough librarian, Carl DeSmet, talking about the sourdough library. So I hope to see you then. Thank, thank you. you.